Well, hello and welcome to episode, gosh, is this episode 10? Yes, it is. Episode 10 of our A Plan Account podcast series where every week we get together and discuss a lection of, from the lectionary uh, for the upcoming Sunday. Um, Alicia and I were active on the message boards, as some of you may have seen, and we saw that many of you were uh, heading towards the book of James in this next season. Uh, so we really wanted to pay attention to where you guys are headed, uh, and we wanted to focus on James in our conversation here today. Uh, I'm still contemplating, honestly, whether I'm going to transition from Mark to James, so this conversation will be helpful in making that decision for me. Um, but uh, we hope that this... What? You're thinking about not preaching the gospel text? I know. Who I, are I, you? Yeah, I, I'm like 80-20, okay? 20% wondering if I'm going to move, so... I, I needed to retain my my um, salvation here. So my I sanctification relies on this. No, <laughs> I don't know. I am in Idaho. We we kind of lead the, the Nazarene ship here. So I have to stay the true. <laughs> Can we start over? I feel like we need, okay. We'll just <laughs> um, this is going to be a great conversation. I'm really. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And we need to. Uh, um, I think it's a really good transition from Mark uh, 7 to James 2, where the Pharisees tended to show it, uh, their t leanings towards favoritism um, in regards to cleanliness and uh, what they saw as unclean. Um, and James really does take that conversation as center focus here. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, dive right in and I'll give uh, this a read before we start discussing some of the things that's going on here. Uh, James chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to read uh, all of the verses, including the those ones that are in parentheses there uh, to shape our conversation. I'm going to read from the Common English uh, version. My brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, here's an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person you say, stand over there, or here, sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My dear brothers and sisters, listen, hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Don't the wealthy make, it, make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good name spoken over you at your baptism? You do well when you really fulfill the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. And by the same law, you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Anyone who tries to keep all of the law but fails at one point is guilty of failing to keep all of it. The one who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. So if you commit adultery, but do, do commit murder, you are a lawbreaker. In every way, then, speak and act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. There will be no mercy in judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say, they have faith but do nothing to show it. Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. This is the written word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, there seems to be quite a bit there. Um, I think one of the first things that sticks out to me as I'm reading is how different James seems to be approaching the law than uh, Paul does. Uh, James seems to have more of a positive approach to the law of Israel. 
than than Paul seems to approach the law. Um, did you notice that in in the reading of that passage? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Paul really approaches the law super faithfully. Like he cares a lot about the law and the way that that shapes um, the people of Israel and the way that that continues to shape the new Christian church. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I I don't know if I would use the terms like positive and negative, but I do think it's super clear that they approach the law differently. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. Right. I think that's what I was more pointing out is that he, in regards to Gentiles being faithful to that law of Israel, James seems to have more of a, uh, maybe to not use the word positive, just more of an encouragement there than I would feel from Paul encouraging mm -hmm. the Gentiles to, to be faithful to that. Um, yeah. I don't know. That was just one of the things that seemed to stick out. Um, what are, where would you start in re regards to his message on favoritism here? Oh, goodness. There, there's a lot going on in this passage and so much to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think it's really interesting that James points to favoritism as a, uh, as a particular offense against the faithfulness of Christ, mm -hmm. right? That in some way to show favoritism to one social class over another, um, particularly to show favoritism to the rich, over the poor, um, like in some ways denies the faithfulness of mm. Christ. Mm. And I think that that's really interesting where uh, we start we start there that um, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus. Um, and then uh, later on in verse seven, when you act in that way, you insult the good name spoken over you at your baptism. So you deny the faithfulness of Christ that's then expressed in the body of believers. Mm -hmm. And you deny your like new identity or you right. deny faithfulness to your new identity as a people of God. Um, and then, and then it sort of leads us to that like really famous line from James faith is dead without faithful action or right. or faith is dead without those works that demonstrate faith and um, so that's super interesting to mm -hmm. me and would it be i think it's good to understand the social context that's going on here as well but um i've heard many scholars talk about how there's a great big divide between the extremely poor and the extremely rich more so than could be uh, shown in ratios in today's society, like the the gap between the wealthy and the and the poor, at least in Western countries, is not as extreme as it would be in in that context of of James society. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot more of a, um, I think, a higher tension when the gap is greater. <laughs> um, and the one of the main ways of maybe climbing that social ladder was to rub shoulders with those who were wealthy and who were in that that status to then um, gain political power over over certain parts of the city and things like that and so that i think understanding that it was seen not just as a way of like joining a country club and being among the who's who it was really a way of trying to bring um liberation to your to yourself <laughs> and liberation to others uh, to show favoritism to the rich mm. or uh, in some ways showing favoritism to the rich shows in some senses that you've bought into the schema of the empire that you've bought into the idea that having wealth and power and prestige gets you the influence that you want mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting to me that maybe it's not just about like who looks good in the gathering, but like who's going to get you farther or, right. or there's this sort of ambitious move toward grabbing after power that's implied there, which right. is really interesting. Yeah. And I think both are, are such a temptation, especially when you feel like your livelihood d depends on it. Like, mm -hmm. um, this opening up to more resources because of the power and the wealth that it gives you um, 
you may have more of an urgency to look at that schema as a way of salvation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over the one who has been resurrected into glory, as as James has talked about. Because that's not how Christ entered the world. Christ was born in a major, not in Jerusalem. You know, he, he, he was this, he lived in, in it through a very lowly servant um, position uh, through the world. And that's who we proclaim as King. And so do you think that that's sort of why James condemns this sort of favoritism? Because Jesus, that's not the way of Jesus. Jesus never lived into that sort of mentality. Yeah, I think definitely we start there. Uh, and James starts there to think about the person of Jesus and the way of Jesus. Um, and and we, we have these lines here from James. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? And hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? So we, we get the sense that, that in spite Instead of favoring the rich, God in some really specific ways favors the poor and mm-hmm. chooses the poor mm-hmm. and lends special attention to the poor. And I think that's one of the things James is trying to um, use as a foundation to call these people back to some faithful action. Mm-hmm. To say, God chooses the poor, you ought to as well. So could, uh, you know, hearing some of my more... Um, devil's advocates in my congregation, couldn't you then say that this is advocating for a particular favoritism to favor the poor over the, the wealthy? <laughs> um, and he's speaking towards a specific uh, type of favoritism here. Yeah, I suppose you could say that. That's one way to frame it. But I think another way to frame it is to say that um, – maybe to return to the idea of like the schema of the empire, or the, the way the empire or the world sees things says like, if you are rich, you are blessed. If you are wealthy, um, you are favored, right? That there's clearly some sense of correlation between um, blessing and favor and prosperity and physical signs of wealth. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But instead, Jesus invites us into a different kind of kingdom, a different kind of schema, a different way of understanding um, what God's world is really about. Um, And that pays no attention to um, those outward signs of wealth and status and prestige. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yeah, so I think the, the, the pushback is to say that to turn special attention to the poor is a particular kind of favoritism. Um, but I think when we look at the model of Jesus, we see that Jesus is advocating just a different way of seeing. Right. Um, it's not like, um, it's not like, well, uh, to talk about maybe the last will be first kind of language and the ways that we see Jesus flipping things on its head. It's not like, Jesus hates rich people, mm-hmm. right? Like Jesus pays attention to them as well. Yeah. Jesus just um, isn't swayed by their consequence or their power or mm-hmm. what they can do for him. Like Jesus isn't interested in any of that because that's not the kingdom that Jesus right. belongs to or the kingdom that Jesus proclaims, right? right? And so then as the people who follow Jesus, we are also not swayed by that kind of consequence or glamour or prestige or power. Like none of that holds any interest mm. to us because we don't belong to that, to that system, to that schema, to that way of, being in the world. Right, right. Yeah, I really like that approach a lot. So it's not necessarily because Jesus doesn't use the poor people for their influence for uh, as a means to an end either. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, cuz the 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 poor folks, the folks who are poor that Jesus spends time with aren't like an object lesson. Mm-hmm. Like he's not using them as some sort of like, oh, look at these people, so poor, so rich in faith. Right. He like, does sound like that though. I mean he's <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, like like Jesus Jesus always sees people and their uh deep humanity mm-hmm. and and who who they are, who they um 
who they will become. Like, like Jesus isn't interested in these like outer signs of wealth and power right. or lack of wealth and power. Like either either way, they're inconsequential. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's helpful to remember that that we're we're talking about the layers beneath these like placements in the world, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, which brings, I think, uh, a really unique perspective on verse six um, that talks about, it, it seems to be even the, the wealthy are taking the poor to court, um, mm. which would at least identify a little bit that the, the tension that's going on in their in their context, but also, like, what can the wealthy have to gain by bringing the the poor to court? Um, they it, yeah. it would seem as if they're a means to uh, stable, because when you have somebody in debt, you have constant money coming in to, to you, right? And that's that's at least what I would think in some of the readings that I've done is that if you take a take a servant to court, like some of the parables that Christ uses, um, they exploit that poor uh, person for the rest of their life in that debt that they need to, to pay off. Um, and so if they drag them to court, then James is pointing here. It's like, do you see how they are dragging you to court to exploit you? Why would you mm -hmm. do that on any level of favoritism then? Why would you exploit anyone <laughs> for your own gain? Uh, for the for the long haul, which Christ never did, right, right, um, and I think that maybe points us back to verse four, um, showing favoritism among yourselves has you becoming evil minded judges. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting phrase, and to me, it suggests that there's something as something to this, like if there are evil minded judges, are there good minded judges, right? Like what's the difference between um, judging with an evil mind or from an evil intent or mal intent and judging with good intent or having like good discernment, I suppose we could say. And mm -hmm. I, I think it comes back to this, like, like who are you and how can I use you? What can you give me? How can you, ex how can you extend my power and my reach and my influence? That's sort of like ambitious and self-serving kind of mm -hmm. judgment. Because it seems like that's what these folks are doing. And also, I mean, we I think we can all admit that we've done that before. Wow. Like like yeah. you're at a networking event, you're like, who can help me get the mm -hmm. furthest? Right. Like yeah. like everyone thinks that way in some in some sense. But it seems like James is saying that's evil-minded judging, right? Like instead, we ought to be saying something different or or having some other way of judging or discerning or filtering um the the folks that we encounter and he seems to put jesus as an example like jesus who eats with everyone jesus who responds to everyone with compassion mm -hmm. that's yeah that's so good where where should we head next uh as that with that as our springboard in this passage Because the contrasts uh, speak and acts of people who will be judged uh, by the law of freedom. So it does kind of indicate that there is some judging taking place, but the, the foundation from which judging occurs and mercy <laughs> is this, mm -hmm. this goal or law uh, governance of freedom. Uh, I th think that would be good to unpack a little bit. Yeah. How would you take us there? Well, he, as as I said at the beginning, he has this very uh, great encouragement of abiding by the law, and and James almost goes say, says it without coming out and saying it that the spirit of the the law that was given to the people <clears throat> were for the needs of the people. It wasn't the as Jesus would say, Sabbath. Uh, people weren't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made to meet the requirements of the people, and. Mm -hmm. And James really does have that uh, sub sub narrative here about how uh, the law of freedom really needs to govern how we judge and show mercy to one another. Um, that that the law wasn't made, um, the people weren't made to meet the requirements of the law, but the law was made to meet the requirements of people, and that's what Jesus really embodied in his life. Um, and so as we look at those laws and 
we should have an intent in keeping them all um, that we shouldn't isolate murder and adultery as like, well, we can commit one and not the other, but as this one cohesive uh, spirit that, that God gave us to, to mm -hmm. shape us and give us freedom um, that if we abide by these laws of God, then freedom naturally comes about in our relationships with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, I hear, I hear notes of speaking against saying our religious life is our own private individualistic endeavor, that it really does have a deep relational component. And James is really speaking to a, a deeply relational uh, faith rather than one that just says, well, that law is good for them. This law is good for me. And we'll see how this works out. <laughs> you know, that doesn't, doesn't really work out that way if we have this, um, this kind of varied approach to um, or maybe a, a stark relativism when it comes to God's law is it only relates to myself. We need to understand how it relates and impacts those who we may not even understand the world through their perspective. You know, how, how are we going to work together um, in carrying out that law of freedom? Yeah. And then is that spirit of cohesiveness, that community, is that, part of this good name spoken over you at your baptism mm -hmm. that you're baptized into the body of christ yeah. like into that spirit of freedom into that spirit of community into that new life and new way and new being like mm -hmm. i i think that those are connected as well that the, the more the more we remember our baptism and remember the body to whom we belong, mm -hmm. then the more that we begin to embody that spirit of freedom and that law of freedom, that, mm -hmm. that different way of seeing and being in the world. Yeah. And the beauty of that is that when you start to embody and see um, through that, that way of freedom, it naturally pours out and inherently suggests that freedom will be granted to others mm, through mm -hmm. your living and application of that. Um, that it's not just a one, uh, one way street that you're, <laughs> you will see that freedom being granted to those, which, you know, I, I think it's such a, a command of love to care for the poor uh, in, in this, in the big picture here, because when with James call to love as Christ loves and that favoritism speaks against Christ is that when we go to serve the poor, if we want to do that faithfully and well, it naturally breaks apart any sort of preconceptions we have about what it's like to live in poverty. If we're building relationships with those people, it naturally calls us to change some of our, our habits and some of our practices. So mm -hmm. in order to bring freedom uh, to th these who are in poverty, uh, as along with the freedom that we seek in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, it's, I'm convinced more and more that God doesn't tell us what to do, um, unless it has our best interest at the center of it. Like every single command <laughs> has our best interest at the center, even though it sucks to to obey sometimes it's always for our best interest i can say sucks on a podcast right i think so <laughs> i think you just did so okay good um but that leads us to the to the showing of of faith um mm. towards the end of the of the passage which really embodies that relationship with with the poor um having more of a declarative element of our faith rather than one that embodies it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it does take us to this place of, um, if we're going to deny acts of favoritism and instead lean into the faithfulness of Christ, what does that look like in faithful action? How do mm -hmm. we faithfully embody and live out this, this call um, to, yeah, to deny favoritism, to lean into a spirit of community and cohesion, to recognize that um, the new life and freedom that Christ has given us is also for everyone is contagious in some ways. How do we how do we step into those places? Um, I'm left also with the questions of like, what acts of favoritism do we as pastors and preachers need to call out in our own communities? Like, what does that look like in our gatherings? Um, when we come together, uh, where do we need to be 
encouraged and pushed to further lean into the body of Christ and mm-hmm. the faithfulness of Christ. Um, yeah. Like, what does that look like? Cause I don't, I don't know if the favoritism in our American churches would be so starkly built around the rich and the poor. I, I would say that favoritism comes out a bit more uh, politically who has the more political um, perspectives that we share. (laughs) They'd show favoritism to those who maybe think that way, uh, think like us uh, rather than think in in different ways. Generationally, we -hmm. like to kind of gather around those who are in our same uh, age range. Um, And we've seen in recent history, racially is is always such a stark tension that we show favoritism to those who maybe look and sound like us um, in some significant ways. So I may be incorrect in that, that it would not be as stark with the, with the rich and the poor because there's not such a huge gap, but I tend to see favoritism shown uh, towards those dynamics. Um, I think the one you've forgotten is gender. I think we show a lot of favoritism toward other kinds of power dynamics. I think also maybe it's fair to recognize that both you and I serve in um, uh, pretty unified communities, right? Like I, I think you would classify your context as fairly like middle class in, um, in Idaho, more or less. Is that fair? Yeah, middle yeah. class, rural patriotism. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then my community is a very poor community. Like our our Sunday morning gatherings are built around food distribution because my people are poor and hungry. Um and that's pretty like that's pretty we don't have rich folks coming into our um into our services on Sunday like we're all poor. Mm-hmm. Um so so I don't think the favoritism is shown toward like rich and poor, but it is, I think, shown in in other kinds of ways. Like I think I've mentioned before on the podcast that I serve a, a multilingual, multi-congregational uh, church. And so I pastor the English speaking congregation, but my folks speak different languages at home. Tagalog and Mandarin and Spanish are the ones that I hear in the fellowship hall. And so those communities gather together like around their own tables, right? And mm-hmm. so they gather with the folks who speak their same language, who look like them. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I specifically see a lot of favoritism toward gender. There's um, a Sunday school class uh, like a Sunday morning adult Sunday school class. And the the older gentleman who's been teaching that class has been teaching it for decades, for years. Um, and we recently kind of repainted the room and set it up so that it could be a little bit more facilitated for other meetings and those kinds of things. And I intentionally moved the table so that it was really difficult to have a head or a foot. And so mm-hmm. just like the chairs are on either side of the long table, but never fail every Sunday, this older gentleman moves a chair, though it's really uncomfortable, to the head of the table because that is his place, mm. right? Um, and it it drives me bonkers. Like I, I, I'm really trying to, to usher us into this place where we can sit around the same table where there aren't these positions of authority. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but he seems deeply attached to it. And not only, not only that, but the, but the other folks seem really deeply attached to showing deference to that kind of like, like patriarchal authority. And I, I, I'm I, still wrestling with how do we kind of shepherd people out of that space. But right. those are the places where I see favoritism in my community. It's not so much sure. along the, the lines of social class or wealth, but it's around gender and age mm-hmm. specifically. Yeah. I'd say in, in the Boise context, uh, probably um, because of the independence that is brought by a more stable financial income and things like that the the lines in which i see most rigid are those who can provide the level of self-sufficiency that is that is um that everyone seems to be seeking so whoever can can gain that the most seems to have some sort of ingrained favoritism shown towards them that oh you know you you're able to have this same sort of self-sufficiency because it t- changes the dynamic of 
interdependence and relationship. Um, and so they kind of tend to, to clamor around those who have the same level of self-sufficiency as they do. <laughs> um, because uh, when you have people who are dependent on, on, for help from other people, it becomes uncomfortable for Northwest rugged individuals <laughs> <laughs> and trying to break that sort of dynamic is, is difficult. Um, well, I think using the contrast of our communities, I think is really helpful in, in looking at the last few verses here, 14 through 17. Um, a couple of Sundays ago, I, I talked about how we seem so intent, especially in the culture of social media and news. We, we hear a lot about people declaring their faith and mm -hmm. like what they believe um, and very little, not just very little desire on embodying that and living it out, but there's so much focus and attention on declaration from the audience that there, there almost seems very little questions being asked like, well, how does, how are they living that out though? Like, how do we see that playing out in their, their morality or their, the way that they live their lives? It just seems to be all about how well we can advertise this, <laughs> this mm. and, and to, to do it well. So I use the example of um, Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy, you know, in the <laughs> middle of his office. And he's like, I, she yells it to the whole room and says, I declare bankruptcy. And then he's cutting up his credit cards and Oscar, the, the accountant comes in and says, you know, you can't just yell bankruptcy in the room and expect anything to change. And he's like, I didn't yell it. I declared it. Right. <laughs> so like it, we seem to fit that, that sort of model, at least in American Christianity, where we, we get really focused on declaring our beliefs to the government or declaring our beliefs on Facebook. And we don't tend to, know how to how to live that out with that with a result of seeing people liberated <laughs> with a result of seeing the hungry fed and and the poor cared for um and and that's at least what i see in my local context how would you see that uh, playing out in yours yeah uh i i think it's easy for me to see folks with deeply compartmentalized lives. So mm -hmm. they they come on Sunday and they care about feeding hungry people. Um, I'm just not sure how how that's working out in the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, this is with like like giving giving some grace and some understanding and flexibility oh, to yeah. my right. my people who who have um low self-esteem or low like a low sense of self-efficacy like they just don't feel like they can do much um so a big part of my work as their pastor is to tell back to them their stories that are worth celebrating and to help them gain this sense of um of understanding who they are and what they can do and who they can be in the world um I think that points us to some of the some of the words earlier in our passage that that if we're going to be grounded in this love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? Like you have to have this proper understanding of who you are, um, who God says you are, um, who God calls you to be and to become. And I think if we can start there, then we then we can begin to move from like a mentality of scarcity or like I have to get mine or take care of myself mm -hmm. um, and can move to this place where we're, we're communally involved in each other's well being, where we're looking right. after each other and caring for each other. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing like, I'm seeing some of that, but, but it's hard to move from this, this place of fear or of scarcity or of like, like I got to take care of me and mine mm -hmm. um, into a place of, um, that law of freedom where you're free to look after each other or you're free to trust the community ah. to be responding to your needs where you're, where where you're free to where you're free from that worry or that sense of um yeah that sense of scarcity i know i've used that word a couple times but that's the one that just kind of keeps coming to my mm -hmm. mind no absolutely uh, Bergamon's myth of scarcity comes to mind with that. that are we yeah. operating under a, a myth or the reality of the abundance of God? Yeah, uh, Brene Brown as well is a good place to start a, a sort of like inner 
inner default setting of your mind where you just right. feel like you're operating in the sense of scarcity rather than abundance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's she's such a great writer. Um, so I, I think at least in regards to myself, maybe what I'd suggest the preachers listening is that uh, it's important to ask our communities where our priorities lay <laughs> in regards to who we might have default favoritism towards. Um, and in coming out of Mark 7, as I did last Sunday, you know, they're already thinking about uh, who, who do we, are we tempted to call dirty um, and see our own hands as clean um, when who doesn't have dirty hands, you know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, to, to see how there's not really as much of a, um, a, a preference to be shown when, when all of those boundaries are broken down and we are seen for who we really are. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming into this, then it's important to ask, I think, you know, who do, we, who are we tempted to show favoritism to um, how, what's our default setting in regards to um, our treatment of one another? How are we seeing our relationship with God impact our most immediate relationships? Um, and does our faith result in people being fed? Does our faith result in in the impoverished uh, finding a different way of, of life through the way that we live our own? Mm -hmm. But I think most importantly, as it is for me every Sunday, is how am I tempted to do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do I see uh, my default settings maybe lead more tor towards my own freedom rather than a, a corporate freedom? Yeah. Um, how how does my 21st century male Idaho and American perspective not lend itself to the perspective of the kingdom um, and seeing the ways in which they differ and and seek the faithful way? Um, mm -hmm. I think once those questions are really wrestled with in, in my own heart, I'm able to get up and speak authentically about this uh, to my people. Yeah, that's so well said. I think the only the only thing I would add is like a continued discussion um, about at least as I'm a, a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene and I pastor a church mm -hmm. of the Nazarene um, to really call us back to our identity as um, as ones who give special attention to the poor um, and to speak about our roots and heritage and identity there. Um, yeah. I, I think in in my community in particular, um, we have some of the raw material, but we need a lot of like like theological framing to help mm -hmm. us find some roots and some grounding in mm -hmm. in that kind of work. Um, so for me, this 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 uh, passage offers a great opportunity to do some of that like doctrinal work. Um, that's it's not always so like easily packaged right, um, right. To, to speak to some of that like theological foundation mm -hmm. um so it's a that's a great opportunity for me yeah that's that's really really well said as a holiness people this should fit exactly into who we are aspiring to be as mm -hmm. as the church of the nazarene that's really good well any other closing uh thoughts as we as we wrap up our our conversation Uh, I mean, I think that we've covered quite a lot, a big, like a big spectrum of things. Um, I would just remind folks that we've got some commentaries coming uh, onto the website. So go visit a plain account and um, yeah, read some of those commentaries there. If you're preaching through James, let, let us know. Uh, shoot us some questions, send us what you're wondering about or things you're working through. Uh, we'd love to be able to bring those on air and to talk about them here on the podcast next week. I think we'll be in James through the end of September. And I I forget what our final tally is, but on the message board, I think we've got maybe 10 pastors yeah. who chimed in to say, hey, we're preaching through James for the month of September. So we'd love to hear from you all and see what's on your hearts and minds and how we can continue to be a support uh, digging into that in conversation. Absolutely. And if you haven't followed us, uh, we try to leave as many open doors to the website as possible through Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook and things like that. So if you want to find us on those uh, avenues, we're always updating with the quotes and some other ways in which to 
um, to dialogue. So there's there's many opportunities to get involved in the conversation, and uh, mostly because we want to hear your voice. So please uh, join the conversation and, and help us out into making this podcast what it needs to be uh, for our listening audience. We all we all play a part there. So thanks a lot for those of you who joined. Uh, we hope this conversation was well. Uh, please give Alicia and myself some feedback as we're uh, working to make this uh, podcast what it needs to be. And Alicia, thanks again for your insightful uh, conversation. Thanks, Ben. And yeah. peace to all of our listeners. We're praying for you as you bring a faithful word to your people. Yeah. Peace be with you as well.